Hi, I'm Melissa McKay, a developer advocate with JFrog. I'm thrilled to be here with you at this online version of JFocus. I've given this talk several times now and I really enjoy it. I hope that you do too. What's coming up is a pre-recorded version of the talk, but one of the upsides of that is that I am online with you right now. So don't be afraid to engage with me in the chat, ask any questions as they come up. Certainly don't feel like you need to wait until the end for a Q&A. So let's talk about leveling up your Java container images. Um, just to set some expectations up front, there is a lot of information about Docker in this talk, but this is not a tutorial or a deep dive on Docker commands or anything. There is a ton of documentation already out there on that. When I put this talk together, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to dive in with some research and focus more on how we got here and answers to some of the big why questions. My hope is that you'll come away with a better understanding of the history behind containers, how they actually work on your system, some of what is really going on under the covers, and some tips and tricks to put in your toolbox the next time you build a Docker container. That said, I'm excited to share with you today some of the things that I've learned about containers. All right, I'm not gonna linger on this slide too long because we have a ton to cover. So grab your phones, get this QR code, um, take a screenshot so you can quickly get this link. This is where my slides will be. Also, JFrog has some t-shirts to give away, um, three of them actually. So this is where you can enter a raffle during the session and for a limited time afterward to get yourself one of those t-shirts. All right, a little bit about where I come from. My background is in software engineering and development. I've been a developer in some way, shape, or form now for over 20 years. Most of my professional experience has been in server-side development and Java, but I've had the privilege of working on many different teams over the years in a variety of different technologies, languages, and different tool sets. My most recent experience pushed me into some new territory. This was while working on teams beginning to practice DevOps. And that's where I got the privilege to learn more about how these apps I was working on were actually being deployed. I got a lot of exposure and to a variety of tools in the DevOps ecosystem. I started speaking a few years ago and decided that that was something I wanted to do more of. So I made the jump to the developer relations team with JFrog last February. That means I'm coming up on my year anniversary. So I'm pretty, pretty excited about that. All right, that's enough about me to get some context. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll begin with a brief history to give you some background. This hopefully won't be too boring, but hang in there because there's some important milestones in the past that are good to know to get a better understanding of how we got to where we are today. We'll take a look at the container market and what's been going on there the last few years. Uh, then we'll move into getting a real understanding of what Docker is. Docker is not synonymous with containers. After that, we'll be in an excellent place to talk about what containers actually are, and then we'll review a few common container gotchas. Last but not least, um, I'll give you a, just a little bit of a couple of resources where you can um, learn more about managing your container images. All right, just before we dive into our agenda, there are two reasons I'm showing you this slide. I'd love to know uh, how you are using containers today. So take a moment and give me some feedback about that. And two, if you haven't considered this before, there are some good reasons for using containers other than for just production. Uh, the top two listed here um, are to provide consistent development environments and uh, testing or QA environments where you can still gauge the quality of your applications with significantly less resources than a production environment. All right, let's jump in and start learning about containers. Now, I'm pretty sure that wasn't the picture that you're expecting. I mean, where is that classic shipping container photo that uh, you usually see with these presentations? Um, there's a couple of reasons that I've chosen to show bananas here and go with a bananas theme. First and foremost, I'm just tired of seeing shipping containers on every presentation about Docker or containerization in general. So I've started a rebellion. And I, I hope that you will enjoy this banana theme and that um, if you happen to do a presentation, maybe pick something different than um, shipping containers. That would be great. Second, this is really a story about how our industry has adapted to dealing with limited resources over time. And bananas remind me of a story that my grandfather would tell me when I was growing up. 
Uh, it went like this. Uh, when he was a kid, he would, he would get a single banana once a year, uh, usually over the holidays on Christmas. Uh, this must have been during the 20s and early 30s. And during that time, bananas were a rare treat for my grandfather's family. None of that banana was going to go to waste. So he and his siblings would scrape that banana um, with a fork, scrape the peel to get every last bit of that banana off because they knew they weren't gonna get another one until next year. So maybe that's not the most solid analogy, but I liken that story to how computing resources were in the 1960s and 70s. Very limited and very expensive. On top of that, it took forever to get anything done. Often a computer would be dedicated for a long period of time to a single task for a single user. Obviously, those limits on time and resources created all kinds of bottlenecks and inefficiency. And just being able to share wasn't enough. There needed to be a method to share without getting in each other's way or having one person inadvertently causing an entire system to crash for everyone. This need for better strategies and sharing compute resources actually started a path of innovation that we see massive benefits from today. There are some key points in time that brought us to this state that we are in today with containers. And I'm going to begin our container history lesson with Chirut. Chirut was born in 1979 during the development of the seventh edition of Unix and was added to BSD, the Berkeley software distribution in 1982. Being able to change the apparent root directory for a process and its children, which Teru allowed you to do, was um, that resulted in a bit of isolation to provide um, an environment for testing a different distribution, for example. Teru was a great idea, solved some specific problems, but more was needed. The jail command was introduced by FreeBSD in 2000. Jail is more sophisticated than Chirrut in that its additional features help further isolate file systems, users, and networks with the ability to assign an IP address to each jail. In 2004, Solaris Zones brought us ahead even further by giving an application full user, process, and file system space and access to system hardware. Solaris Zones also introduced the idea of being able to snapshot a file system. In 2006, Google jumped in with their process containers. These were later renamed C groups, which centered around isolating and limiting the resource usage of a process. And moving right along in 2008, C groups were merged into the Linux kernel, which along with Linux namespaces led to IBM's development of Linux containers. 2013 was a big year. This is the year that Docker came on the scene, bringing their ability to package containers and move them from one environment to another. That same year, Google open sourced their Let Me Container That For You project, which provided applications the ability to create and manage their own subcontainers. From here, we saw the use of containers and Docker specifically explode. In 2014, Docker chose to swap out their use of the LXE toolset for launching containers with libcontainer in order to utilize a native Golang solution. That was something interesting that I did not know for a long time that Docker was written in Golang. Go, not Golang, it's written in Go. <laughs> I'm almost done with the history lesson here. Um, I'm skipping over some details around some different projects, organizations and specs that came out during this time because I wanna get what, to what happened in uh, 2015, June of 2015. This event is important to know about because it'll give you some insight into some of the activity and motivations behind shifts in the market. The Open Container Initiative was established. This is an organization under the Linux Foundation that includes members from any major stakeholders, um, from many major stakeholders, including Docker, with the goal of creating open standards for container runtimes and image specifications. While all of this is happening in the container world, there are a couple of other dates that are going to be important to Java Dev specifically. Uh, Java 7 was released in July of 2011, and work was started on Java 8, which was released in March of 2014. Keep these dates in mind because um, when you start containerizing your Java applications, this little bit of history is going to be important to know. Um, I'll be bringing this up again later. All right, that's it for our history lesson. You made it. Uh, let's take a look at what's been going on in the market recently. 
concerning container runtimes. This is more interesting stuff. So I did a little hunting and found that for the last four years, Sysdig, a company that provides a really powerful monitoring and troubleshooting tool for Linux, you're probably aware of this tool, uh, has put out a container report based on analysis of their own users. Part of the report includes data on container runtimes that are in use. In 2017, they analyzed data from 45,000 containers. And there's no graph available here because 99% of the containers were Docker, so they didn't feel the need to split up those results. In 2018, they doubled the sample size. And this time, we're at 83% Docker, 12% CoreOS Rocket containers, and then a couple of others that are uh, sneaking in there. So it looks like other container runtimes besides Docker are starting to encroach a little bit. Moving on to 2019, uh, this Sysdig container report included stats from over 2 million containers. You can see how fast it, the usage has grown. Docker is still holding relatively strong at 79%. 18% is container D, but it's worth noting that container D is a runtime that Docker actually builds on top of. This data is interesting, especially because of what's been happening over the last few years. Um, something to note here is the disappearance of Rocket, which is kind of a sad story. CoreOS was, required, was acquired by Red Hat at the beginning of 2018. Prior to that, Rocket was accepted to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, as an incubating project. And it looks like a promising competitor to Docker's Container D. However, since the CoreOS acquisition, the development of the project went dormant. And in mid-2019, Rocket was archived by the CNCF. In February of 2020, the project was ended. You can technically still get Rocket containers and use them, but the project itself, there, there's no one backing it anymore. This month, Sysdig came out with their 2021 container security and usage report. Obviously, we're at the beginning of 2021, so it's likely um, data that has been gathered for the previous year. It's hard to know if we're comparing apples to apples here, but this report includes a ton of detailed information about their demographics and data sources, as well as other interesting information around what services customers are running and what they're using for orchestration. So if you get a chance and you're curious, you might wanna go check this report out. In a nutshell, what I pulled from it was this. Notice the increase in the usage of Container D from 18% in the previous report to 33%. It'll be interesting to see if that trend continues, especially since Kubernetes announced they'll be deprecating support for the Docker for Docker as runtime later this year. Now I've introduced a few of these other container runtimes that exist out there besides Docker. It's time to start talking about what a container actually is and what Docker actually provides us in order to appreciate the differences between them. So what exactly is Docker anyway? This is a key point. What Docker had over other players in the container game was a focus on commoditizing a complete solution that made it easy for developers to package and deploy their applications. And just to be clear, Docker is a company. It is not a container. It's a company. <laughs> Uh, once containers became, quote, unquote, easy to use, we all witnessed the explosion of tools and resources around them, and the Docker image format rose to become a de facto standard in the market. The stats I showed from Sysdig are specific to container runtimes. That terminology is, is really important to understand here. I'll explain the, the pieces and parts that are involved in working with containers, and you'll immediately understand why Docker, the company, sucked up this market so quickly. As users, let's think about what we actually need to get our apps out there and running. So often we can find ourselves getting so far down into nitty gritty details that we lose sight of the actual problem we're trying to solve. So here's a list of needs broken up into discrete features. Uh, first and foremost, we need that container itself. Some of you might be asking about virtual machines at this point, and discussing VMs is out of the scope of this session. Um, but one thing I will say is that a virtual machine is not the same thing as a container. The biggest difference being that a VM includes an entire OS all to itself, and containers share the system's OS, the system's operating system. The point of the container is to be lightweight and have the ability to move from one environment to another seamlessly and quickly. 
That said, I know there's some developments happening in the VM space, but that's a topic for another time. So the rest of this list quickly is um, we need an image format to define a container. We need a way to build an image of a container. We need a way to manage images. We need a way to distribute and share images. We need a way to create, launch, and run a container environment. And we need a way to manage the life cycle of the running containers. I didn't even get into orchestration or anything at this point, uh, but this is plenty, plenty to prove what I'm saying about Docker. In the context of those developer needs that I just listed, uh, Docker was ready for an, with an answer for everything. Um, you wanna start using containers, they provided Docker engine. Uh, you need an image format, here's Docker image format. Do you need a way to build an image? Well, sure, use a Docker file and call Docker build. You wanna manage images? We'll call Docker images or Docker RM for remove. Do you wanna share your images or use an image from someone else? Call Docker push or Docker pull. Oh, and there's Docker hub where you can store and share all of your images. Do you need a way to launch, run and manage your containers and their life cycle? Call Docker run, Docker stop, Docker PS. Do Docker succeeded in quickly meeting the immediate needs of um, developers in this, con in this container hungry market. Um, it was enough to walk away with a tremendous part of the market share. Remember in our history lesson, when I spoke about the open container initiative, I wanna go into more details here. Out of all of those features that we just discussed that Docker offers us, there are two that were taken up for the cause by the OCI, the image format and the container runtime. Docker did quite a bit of reorganizing their code base, developing abstractions and pulling out discrete functionality. They are a heavy contributor to the OCI, giving the Docker v2 image spec as a basis for the OCI image spec and run C, which was contributed as a reference implementation of the OCI container runtime spec. There are quite a few other container runtimes you might see out there, including Containerd, uh, we discussed Rocket, Cryo, and Kata. All of these have various levels of features for specific use cases. Remember earlier when I mentioned that Docker actually builds on top of Containerd? Well, Containerd was actually contributed by Docker to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and internally it uses Run C. Containerd was integrated into Docker and has been in use since version 1.11 which came out in 2016. So that's, that's old news. It's been a while now since Docker's been using Containerd. The next few years will be interesting to observe what happens with these specs and how the OCI moves forward. There is quite a range of differing opinions about what should and should not be in the standard for a container runtime. We're in a situation where having a runtime that just meets the their minimum requirements of the OCI spec doesn't seem to be enough to drive adoption. I've added a couple of links here that are excellent starting places to learn more about container runtime specifically, if you're curious. The second one uh, is the beginning of a blog series by Ian Lewis, a Google Dev Advocate. Uh, the first subtitle in that blog is literally, why are container runtime so confusing? Ian does a really good job succinctly explaining some of this, and he goes into details about low-level and high-level runtimes and where they might overlap, and it'll explain um, some of that confusion away. Now that we understand all that Docker entails and some of what's going on in the market, let's focus on just the container itself and what that actually looks like on your system. I'll show you how it's stored and what is actually happening under the covers. You'll discover pretty quickly that images and containers aren't really all that magical. My first experience with containers was as a new developer on a project with a tight deadline. It sounds like all projects, right? Uh, the best course of action for me usually is to just jump in and start getting something up and running on my local machine. I learn best by just doing. And the Docker documentation is actually really good for just that. So if you find yourself in a similar position, I recommend going through their Get, get it Started docs, which I've linked here. Going through this guide will get you somewhat comfortable with some of the Docker commands that you're going to need. The first thing to note is that a Docker image is really just a tarball of a complete file system. When an image is unpacked, it's just thrown into its own directory, which becomes its root file system. 
The second is that processes that are involved in running the containers are just regular Linux processes. On top of that, there are just a few Linux features that are used together in a way to achieve the isolation that we want from containers. Namespaces are an important ingredient because uh, these, this is what is used to provide virtual separation between containers. This is how the processes inside a container don't interfere with the host or processes inside another container. Here you can see some of the namespaces that were set up for a Postgres container that I have running on my box. The C groups functionality is integral to constraining how much, how much a container can use uh, system resources like CPU, memory, network bandwidth, et cetera. I can set these constraints by including options on the Docker run command when launching an image. Here you can see that I've constrained the memory usage limit on one of my containers. I'm gonna quickly gloss over some file system details. Uh, where containers and images are actually stored on your file system. First off, after you've installed Docker, running the command docker info will spit out a bunch of information about your installation, including the Docker root directory. This is where most everything you're going to care about regarding your Docker images and containers will be stored. Note that if you're on a Mac, like me, your uh, containers are actually running in a tiny VM. So you're going to need to use a tool like screen or something to get in there and get to the Docker root directory to look around. If you're not familiar with how to use that tool screen, uh, do yourself a favor, go Google it, um, get some practice using it and get familiar with it because it'll mess up your text display pretty good if you don't enter and exit screen the right way. This slide shows how you can get information about the images that you have stored on your system. First, I listed my available images using the Docker images command. I actually have several installed, but only the first couple in the list are displayed here. Using the docker inspect command, I can inspect any image I like using its image ID. This will spit out a ton of in interesting information, but what I wanna highlight here is the graph driver section, which contains the paths to the directories where all of the layers that belong to this image live. Docker images are composed of layers, which represent instructions in the Docker file that was used to build the image originally. These layers actually translate into directories. These layers can be shared across images in order to save space. The lower dir, merge dir, and upper dir sections are especially important. The lower dir directory contains all of the directories or layers that were used to build the original image. These are all read only. The upper dir directory contains all of the content that has been modified while the container is running. If modifications are needed for a read-only layer in lower dir, then that layer is copied into the upper dir where it can be written to. This is called a copy on write operation. It's important to remember that the data in the upper dir is ephemeral data that only lives as long as the container lives. In fact, if you have data that you intend to keep, you should utilize the volume features of Docker and mount a location that'll stick around even after that container dies. This is how most containers uh, that are running it, you know, with, that you need a database for. That's a good example of how to use that, a good use case scenario. Lastly, the merge dir is kind of like a virtual directory that combines everything from lower dir and upper dir. The way the union file system works is that any edited layers that were copied into upper dir will overlay layers in the lower dir. This slide shows I actually have a few containers running on my system. Two of them are my local JFrog container registry installation, which includes a container for Artifactory and a container for a Postgres database. The other is just a simple test container I was playing around with. Note that the container IDs of the running containers match up with the container subdirectory names. Something to remember here is if you stop a container, that corresponding directory doesn't automatically go away until that container is removed with the docker remove command. So you have, if you have stopped containers lying around that never get cleaned up, you might see your available space start to dwindle. There's a docker prune command that you can run uh, that'll help you clean things up. Or you can launch a container with a flag to indicate that it should be removed when it's finished running. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of orchestrators will use this uh, feature. 
The tool sets around building and running images and containers have made things so easy that it's also easy to shoot yourself in the foot in a few places. I'm going to go over some of the most common gotchas, including a JVM specific gotcha that I ran into almost immediately when I first started working with containers. Running is root. The first, <laughs> this is the first one I want to talk about. I'll be honest here, when I was initially getting containers up and running, I was so excited about how well it was working that it was a while before I took this one seriously. Now that you know that processes inside a running container are just like any other processes on the system, albeit a few constraints, it's scary now to run as root inside a container. Doing that opens up the possibility of a process escaping the intended confines of the container and gaining access to host resources. You should be uh, reducing the attack surface of your container by following the principle of least privilege. Although containers are designed not to affect other running containers, if someone gains access to your container and immediately has root privileges, they can wreak havoc on the host. So how do we mitigate this problem? The best thing to do is create a user and use the user command inside the Docker file when the container is built in order to run processes as that user. There's a way to specify a user when the docker run command is used, but that leaves open the possibility of forgetting to do that. It's nice if the image is just set up by default not to run as root. Also pay attention to official images that you pull from Docker Hub and whether or not they run as root or if they leave that up to you to figure out. Even though Docker provides you with the ability to set resource limits on your container, it doesn't automatically do it for you. In fact, the default settings are a free for all with no limits anywhere. So make sure that you understand the resource needs of your application. Too little in your container will die from starvation. Too much in the container could smother others on the system. Um, containers are not, they don't allow you to be lazy. You still need to know how your app runs and what resources are required. The resource usage of your containers is something you're going to want to monitor over time and adjust as needed. It's a good way to determine if something is going wrong or if load on your system has changed for some other reason. Never updating. This is a huge security issue. It's easy to get complacent and not pay attention to what is actually getting pulled in when you build images. Not only do you need to be aware of outdated versions you specify in your Docker file, but you need to pay attention to what's in the base image it's coming from. Not updating packages and libraries inside your container can lead to some embarrassing results, especially when there are tools available now, uh, free ones even, to alert you when security issues have been discovered with specific artifacts. Even ensuring that you're running containers with a non-privileged user has risk when there are known vulnerabilities that exist within your container or even on the kernel of the host for that matter. From time to time, exploits are found that enable attackers to potentially escape a container, so keep up with those security updates. I've been on teams where this has not been a priority, primarily because of the fear of breaking a product or service that's already working. Uh, that's a symptom of a different problem, and probably the whole topic for an entire talk on its own. Trust me, it's much worse to leak private data or potentially be the start of a domino effect that can bring an entire system down. Um, then not update your stuff. All right, this one is Java specific. Uh, this is very, very specific to containerizing Java applications and is very much related to being aware of what your application requires to run successfully uh, regarding memory and other resources. The JVM is pretty clever at automatically determining for your swap and um, the settings for your swap and your heap and your garbage collection behavior based on things like the memory and the number of cores available on the host. Remember earlier during our history lesson when I mentioned the dates, Java 7 and Java 8 came out? Considering the timeline of Docker and those Java releases, Java 7 and early versions of 8 and certainly earlier versions are not fully container aware. This means that your Java application won't necessarily obey memory and CPU constraints that you put on your container and you may end up with some surprise out of memory killer activity. The reason for this is that the mechanisms the JVM used in these older versions to retrieve the resources available come from the actual host machine and not the C group limits that you would expect. There were some improvements around container awareness introduced in Java 8 update 131 and further improvements in later versions, but to really get the benefit of container awareness and all of the associated features, you really should get to Java 11, 
the latest, that's the latest available LTS release that is container aware. All right, image bloat. Um, this generally means you're pulling in large parent or base images that include a bunch of stuff you don't need. That's the most common situation that I see. This increases your, tax, your attack surface area from a security perspective. And shipping these large images around and storing them can become clumsy, slow, and expensive. So um, the first thing you can do, you know, pay attention to what you're pulling in and make sure that um, they're the smallest possible. Um, also, make use of that Docker ignore file to keep additional items that are unnecessary out of your images. I've seen Docker files where the um, entire source tree of a product project, including tests and everything else, are copied over into the, the image. And um, there's um, multiple problems here. Um, one of those, um, copying the entire source tree in one line in the Docker file, uh, that equates to one layer. And that means if anything changes, that entire layer has to be regenerated every build. So try you know, organizing your code so that stuff that changes the most often is in its own layer. Think implementations and abstractions, what gets changed more often, and maybe put those in separate layers. Also, another problem with just um, copying everything is you may unintentionally include your Git directory. Might be something you don't think about to look for in your image, and it might just be in there. So uh, make sure to include that in your Docker ignore file. Um, also, you could be including secrets, who knows? Maybe you have some configuration um, in certain areas, some passwords that you know aren't really, shouldn't be in your code base anyway. But um, even if, if you copy everything in there, even if you are mindful enough to delete those in later, um, later layers, they will still exist in the, the base layers on the machine. So um, even though they might not be uh, immediately visible, they're still there. So it still is a security problem if anyone can get in there and start looking around. All of that said, if you're pulling your Java source code into, into your images, um, you're likely including your build tool as well. I'm talking Maven and Gradle, that stuff. So um, learn to utilize Docker's multi-stage Docker build so that you are not including your build tool along with your production images. Uh, that's just a bunch of extra stuff that you shouldn't, you shouldn't have in there. And uh, that problem is not limited to just Java projects. I've seen that in many different languages. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, last slide. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how to manage your images. Um, ask these questions. Where are your base and your parent images coming from? Are you specifying a container registry in your Docker files? If you are not, the default behavior that Docker uses is to pull from Docker Hub. This is all fine and great until that image doesn't exist anymore, or you can't get to Docker Hub for some reason, or you've hit some threshold with them. Um, that kind of thing can cause you some problems. Uh, the other thing is, where are you storing your proprietary images? Are they uh, protected appropriately? Public registries like Docker Hub do have their purpose. They're an awesome place to share official images and to get some of your services up and running without starting from scratch. But I highly recommend using a private internal container registry that will give you reliable access to required images for your builds that you depend on and um, perhaps avoid some random failures in your pipelines because of network issues or just an image gone missing. Um, you can also better control access to your proprietary images. There are a ton of free tools available out there. Um, if you're new to container registries, at the bottom of this slide is a link to a DZone ref card to help you learn more about why you should set up your own container registry and the things that you should consider when doing that. And if you're, if you're curious how a container registry works and you wanna try one out for free, I've included a link here to a free SaaS version of the JFrog platform that includes support for Maven and Gradle artifacts as well as Docker and other OCI images. There are a lot of other features in there, including security scanning and pipelines that you'll wanna test out too. The last resource on this slide is fuji.io. It's relatively new, exciting place for the Java community. Uh, when you build your images with a particular JDK, because you should, and 
you know, build your own after everything you've learned here today. Uh, build your own images. Don't just rely on something else out there. Um, and you want more specifics on which version or update to use, um, fuji.io is a great place to help you compare Java versions, get detailed info on updates, and compare OpenJDK vendors. So encourage you to take a visit there, take a look around. It's a pretty exciting place. All right, before we move into Q&A, in case you missed this in the beginning, this is your last chance to enter the raffle for one of three JFrog t-shirts. I'll give you a couple seconds to snag this URL and QR code. As mentioned earlier, this is all where, also where my slides will be if you want to review them again later. And that's it. I really hope that you enjoyed this, that you learned something to take back to your teams. Maybe you, maybe most of this stuff you already know, but you learned one thing that I, you didn't. Uh, let me know. Give me some feedback about that. Thanks. <laughs>